Hey guys, it's your tire teacher back again, and this time around we're going to be covering the civil rights movement, or at least the early parts of the civil rights movement. So, uh, it's actually an interesting topic for today, so that's pretty freaking cool. But uh, we're going to go ahead and start off with reviewing um, some post-war, well, post-Civil War legislation, because really we got a Hard, like we got to look back at reconstruction and the stuff that happened prior to the civil rights movement in order to gain a greater understanding of the civil rights movement and how things progressed towards you know towards this so first thing we're going to look at is post-civil war legislation so let's review guys all right we got the 13th amendment the 14th amendment and the 15th amendments so an easy way to remember these guys, these are your Civil War amendments, they're your Reconstruction amendments. So, just think of the three words, free citizens vote. Alright, so, 13th Amendment, you free the slaves. 14th Amendment, equal protection under the law is basically citizenship. Like, citizenship rights, okay? And then the 15th Amendment, universal male suffrage is, well all men have the right to vote. So therefore, free citizens vote. That's how you can remember your 13th, your 14th, and your 15th amendments. Now, what happens after that are some civil rights cases um, that happened in the 1880s. In particular, 1883, you've got some civil rights cases that, uh, you know, go into narrowly interpreting the 14th amendment. So this is how stuff like you know, the stuff that the Redeemer governments were passing, Jim Crow laws, all of that is able to start coming up to the surface. And so, um, this all culminates with the court case Plessy versus Ferguson, where we get this whole doctrine of separate but equal. Remember, it's like, hey, um, yeah, th there's separate restrooms. They're, they're not really equal, but since it's a restroom, it's equal kind of stuff. So, this allowed for legal segregation of public places, private places, just basically everywhere. This is where you get your dumb Jim Crow laws <laughs> saying that blind black people and blind white people can't go to the same school for the blind. Yeah. <laughs> or, hey, you can't have a black burial in a white cemetery. Yeah that kind of stuff. So Jim Crow laws are going to be prevalent basically in the 1890s with Plessy versus Ferguson kind of kickstarting that stuff all the way through the 1950s. And these are the things that civil rights is going to target big time along with um, other areas of society that inherently keep African Americans and other minorities from, well, progressing. So um, Jim Crow laws will mandate segregation, prevent blacks from voting via, like, grandfather clauses, um, where, hey, poor white guy, your grandpa can vote, then yeah, you can vote too, kind of thing. So, um, poll taxes are another one where you had to pay to vote, and literacy tests, which, yeah, would target a person's education and prevent them from voting or have these impossible <laughs> tests to try to like pass which are very subjective and yeah it just doesn't end up working anyways so some examples of jim crow at work with segregation is this right here you see the water fountains the colored water fountain looks like something you'd find outside at a park the white water fountain looks like the nice cooled one, right? That has refrigerated water and such. Nice cold water to drink. So, this is what we see. This is segregation. Or a couple of examples of that. You know, sitting at the back of the bus. Um, sitting, you know, at other places, like on the other side of the lunch counter. Just sitting in the balcony of the movie theater. That kind of thing. Okay? basically just keeping everybody separate. But we do start to see like people fight against these racial inequalities with the formation of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. So starting off in the progressive era, we got muckrakers like Ida B. Wells, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, Henry Moskowitz, 
Mary White Ovington, Oswald Garrison Villard, and William English Whaling. All these people be involved in the NAACP. So it wasn't just black people, it was white people as well as you could see in the picture right here. Um, you could see how together they were trying to fight for more rights for African Americans. So through the NAACP is where you're going to get the biggest pushback towards, you know, Jim Crow and segregation. So the NAACP is going to provide legal aid, which is going to be instrumental in challenging Jim Crow laws in the courts. And that's where a lot of the progress is being made. So they start to try to um, eradicate institutionalized racism and fulfill the 14th Amendment, which basically is trying to guarantee equal protection under the law, equal treatment, right? So one of the first avenues that the NAACP goes after is education. And this is going to be key when we talk about cases like Brown versus Board, which we're going to talk about today. So just hold on. But anyways... Um, where we start to see, like, a rise in, like, pride in the African-American community is going to be through the Harlem Renaissance. Remember, because this was started off by the Great Migration. African-Americans were moving from the South to the factory jobs up North in places like Chicago, New York. And what they're bringing along with them is culture. So cultural diffusion at its finest is here in the Harlem Renaissance. Jazz and blues becomes ultra popular in these places. In Harlem, right? Uh, food, art, I mean, pretty much all of this is culminating during the Harlem Renaissance. And um, you got authors, you got historians, you got just writers, dancers, poets, everybody pretty much contributing to black culture you know, tracing it back to African American roots, you know, way back, and celebrating the community. So there's more pride in the African American community. So by the time World War II hits up, there's still some segregation going on. Well, actually, there's a lot of segregation going on. But we're going to start to chip away at that. Starting with A. Philip Randolph here. Um, he is part of a labor union, which is the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. And he meets up with FDR, or he basically says, hey, FDR, we're going to, like, threaten a march on Washington during World War II when you need everybody working in the factories unless you change the hiring discrimination practices or basically discrimination in general in um, government jobs. So, African Americans were treated poorly with these factory jobs that were handled by the government, and because FDR doesn't want that march on Washington, he decides to sign Executive Order 8802, which ends discrimination in government jobs, or any place that has a government contract. And since this is World War II, where the government assumed control of factories to make munitions and weapons and whatever for war, this opens up the door to end discrimination and segregation in these places. So, black women are basically doing the Rosie the Riveter. It wasn't just white women. It was black women too, because now the doors have been opened for them. And they can contribute to the war effort just as much as the men who were contributing as well. Now, when we talk about the military, though, the military is still highly segregated, and historically it has been segregated, even in the beginnings of the Civil War, when we first started letting black troops enter the military. So, you can see up there in the top picture, I mean, you've got an all-black regiment, kind of like the Massachusetts 54th Regiment. Spanish-American War, you got some Buffalo soldiers. You know, who all black regiment there. World War One. This black regiment was sent to the French because pff, ugh, racism. Because racism, okay? And the French were like, Yes, come come around and the French were cool with the African American troops sent to them. They even gave them their version of the Medal of Honor. So World War Two, we haven't learned our lesson. We still got segregated troops. The Tuskegee Airmen, who were like the badasses of the skies. <laughs> I mean, they're, seg they're an all-black group. 
you know, we're still segregating the troops, but when the war is over and President Truman has taken over because FDR passed away, Truman's the one who takes on desegregating the military with his executive order 9981. So now that the military has been desegregated and you've got black troops alongside white troops and Hispanic troops and everybody, okay, this is when the ball kind of starts rolling because you know what? Around this same year, baseball is also going to desegregate. So th there's this thing about baseball history. Baseball history mirrors American history. So maybe as like a side video, I'll, I'll do something like that towards the end of the year. But yeah, just baseball fans, dude, lots of history you can learn by learning the history of the sport. Legit. Okay, let's go ahead and go back to core. Core starts up in 1942. This is also going to be another big group, not as big as the NAACP, but big enough to really start influencing people in the civil rights movement. It's formed in 1942. It's formed by a group of students in Chicago. They're going to be really influenced by Gandhi's nonviolent techniques, which Gandhi was influenced by Henry David Thoreau. Remember? Civil disobedience, transcendentalism, yeah, it come back around. <laughs> All right. So, um, basically what CORE wants to do is end racism through nonviolent strategies, just kind of like how Gandhi was able to, you know, gain independence for India by employing some of the same techniques. So, these guys want to do sit-ins, jail-ins, freedom rides, nonviolent protests. All right. So what CORE is going to do, like we said, they formed in 1942, influenced by Gandhi's movement. You know, sit-ins, jail-ins, freedom rides is what they're going to do. They are very successful in integrating northern facilities. When they get down south, though, they're going to come into a lot of racism and tension. It's going to get dangerous. So um, there's going to be um, sit-ins, with uh, Greensboro going on and with the Montgomery bus boycott, they're going to loan their support to these guys. Freedom rides with SNCC, which we'll talk about when we get to the 60s. March on Washington. Um, Freedom Summer with the NAACP and SNCC, which we'll talk about in the 60s as well. And yeah, um, we're going to start to see CORE descend more towards radicalism later. But again, we're going to explain this stuff with the second part of the civil rights movement when we get to the 60s. And that's how, like, black power and stuff like that's going to come around. But it, there's a progression to it, so we'll, we'll cover that with the next part. But speaking of baseball, here's Jackie Robinson. Now, baseball broke the color barrier in 1947, which kind of paved the way for American society to start breaking the color barrier, too. Because baseball was our most popular sport at this time. Ever since, like, the eight, you know, the 1800s, man. Baseball's been, like, number one. And so, um, Jackie Robinson is going to be the first black ba baseball player. Hired by the Brooklyn Dodgers, Branch Rickey was the general manager. And he himself had had experience seeing how racism affects his baseball players back when he was a coach slash manager um, in his college days. And he remembers a story of one of his players who was black. And he, they basically didn't allow him to stay with the rest of the team at the hotel. So he had to stay at a separate place. And Branch Rickey remembers a story of, you know, this player just, like, sobbing. And, like, trying to, like, wash his hands and, like, wipe away his black skin. Because he, he felt ashamed by it that you know, that he was being discriminated against because of the color of his skin. So that left an impression on Branch Rickey, and he kind of made it it's his mission that, hey, you know, when I'm in charge of a Major League Baseball team, I'm going to break the color barrier, and that's what he did with Jackie Robinson. He had to get the right type of dude to break the color barrier, and Jackie Robinson was the guy. He was college educated. He fought in World War II. He had the kind of temperament to handle the racism and such criticism and harsh, 
harsh treatment by other players and not lose his cool. I mean, this guy took a lot of crap in his first year, but he persevered and became popular. And so now that we have a popular black baseball player, is paved the way for the rest of American society to say, you know what? If baseball could successfully integrate, maybe the rest of this can. And so that's why, yeah, executive order, you know, uh, 9981 desegregates the military the year after. And then we're going to start to get the ball rolling even further with stuff like Brown versus Board a couple years later. So, um, we're going to start to see more and more in um, the 1950s. I mean, people were influenced by World War II. Let's face it, we're fighting fascism, we're fighting the Nazis and like, you know, Mussolini and just people like that who were like pretty much promoting, you know, eugenics and like racial superiority of one race over another and so it would be kind of hypocritical of us to like promote basically the same freaking thing right with jim crow and with racism and segregation so the african-american community looks at how they're treated in this country after this country basically told them hey fight against the nazis so that's why kind of like after world war ii this is when we get more of a pushback by the african-american community to go ahead and try to dismantle segregation we start off with the schools because they're segregated. Um, hit up the poll taxes, the literacy tests, the grandfather classes. And, you know, by attacking all of these archaic institutions, able to get more, more mobility, more equality. Because, I mean, these institutions had left the African American community poor, uned mostly uneducated. There's such economic discrimination. I mean, these people are kept in a constant state of poverty. So, black leaders want to improve, you know, the African American's way of life. And so, they want to show that racial segregation is harmful. The NAACP works on that. They're trying to overturn Plessy versus Ferguson. And in the late 40s, with the court case Sweat versus Painter, um, pretty much this is with the ut school of law and um what this court case says is that separate law schools for white and blacks violates the 14th amendment's equal protection clause so this is kind of one of those primary cases that makes it possible for when brown versus the board of education comes around we could just open the gates wide open and get rid of segregation in schools point blank period all right doesn't mean there's not going to be pushback there is there is but legally this is what we get we're going to start to see segregation dismantled in schools we got to go with baby steps though so far we're tackling law school here public law school we haven't even done private school, private universities yet. We haven't even gone there with public and private schools as far as like elementary and secondary education. We're getting there. But Brown versus Board of Education is one of these big landmark cases that is going to go through the Supreme Court and NAACP lawyers like Thurgood Marshall are going to argue successfully in front of them. So with Brown versus Board, this is the one that really overturns Plessy versus Ferguson and basically says separate is inherently unequal. All right. Those are the words from Chief Justice Earl Warren here and that school should be school segregation should end with all deliberate speed. So here we go. We finally have the overturn to Plessy versus Ferguson we need to go ahead and start dismantling segregation at the school level. So, a lot of people were like super angry at uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren. He was appointed by Eisenhower, who's conservative, and this guy ends up being like one of the most liberal justices ever. Um, so, yeah, 60s. <laughs> well, he's gonna be the main Supreme Court justice in the, he's gonna be Chief Justice in the 60s, mostly. But, 
you know, he's going to be a very activist judge, so a lot of civil rights cases go through him. A lot of rights of the accused cases go through him. So we're going to break down Chief Justice Earl Warren a bit more when we cover the 60s. But all right, like I said, even though legally segregation is done in schools thanks to Brown versus Board, there is pushback. Pushback by the South. So what we see is Congress is going to sign the Southern Manifesto condemning Supreme Court for an abuse on judicial power. States are going to temporarily close public schools and set up private schools. Governor Faubus is going to be doing some of the most vocal pushback out of all of this, though. When he openly defies the law and sends the Arkansas National Guard to prevent nine African-American students from enrolling in Little Rock Central High School. So, um, Governor Faubus meets with Eisenhower, because Eisenhower sees this, and, you know, Eisenhower's like, whoa, what's going on, dude? Um, and... Eisenhower believes African-American students would be allowed to enroll after he meets with Governor Faubus, but Governor Faubus defies this. He um, removed the National Guard, leading to violence a few days later when the students enrolled, and then the president sees all this stuff go on. Um, Though Eisenhower's kind of on the fence about this, he doesn't really actively support desegregation or the Brown decision, but... He knows it's his constitutional duty to uphold federal authority and follow and carry out the Supreme Court's ruling. So he's going to order the troops to stand guard for the Little Rock Nine, as we call them. And these nine students are going to be basically escorted by the troops to get into this high school. So... There is a lot of pushback by Southern governors. And, I mean, these are the kind of scenes that we see. How scary is that, you know, to be that student right there? And you've got an angry mob just, like, shouting at you, wanting to do harm to you. These kids, these nine students, had to, had to walk together to class. For their own safety. Walk together to school for their own safety. Because really, if they were separated, I mean, who knows what's going to happen to them. So Jackie Robinson, even though, you know, he just broke the color barrier for baseball, he's going to be very instrumental and very vocal when it comes to the civil rights movement. This guy has a political opinion. <laughs> and um, He's extremely supportive of the civil rights movement. And here we go. He's writing a letter to Eisenhower, you know, speaking out in favor of the Little Rock Nine. So what we're going to see in the 50s is a lot of changes go on with the civil rights movement. Of course, we've got Rosa Parks, right? She's one of the most famous people in the civil rights movement. You guys know she refused to give her a seat and go to the back of the bus and she was arrested for it, right? So, the more important thing that happens after that, though, is the Montgomery bus boycott. This is what goes on. Um, because Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to sit in the back of the bus, Martin Luther King Jr. here, along with his group, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, are going to successfully organize a bus boycott. Which means that the African American community that supports them is not going to ride the public buses anymore in that city of Montgomery. This is detrimental to them because the majority of the customers of public transportation are African American in Montgomery, Alabama. And since this bu bus boycott lasts until over a year later, I mean 381 days, the city of Montgomery is definitely hurting from this bus boycott. So, what's going to happen is the Supreme Court's going to rule that segregation laws are unconstitutional. And um, so, now that we've 
gotten buses desegregated, it's a matter of time to get the rest of societies desegregated. So, Gavin, um, Eisenhower is going to sign some civil rights legislation. Doesn't do much, the Civil Rights Act of 57, but, but, <laughs> okay, he's going to establish a Civil Rights Commission. That's going to have, be part of the Justice Department, have a bunch of new powers to protect voting rights for African Americans. But the South is still going to discourage African Americans from voting via violence from the KKK and other extreme measures. Now, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference that we brought up with the bus boycott, this is Martin Luther King Jr.'s group. And... Um, the leaders are, well, MLK, right? Um, Ralph David Abernathy, Fred Shuttleworth, and Bayard Rustin. So, these four, not just Martin Luther King, but these four guys are instrumental in conducting the boycotts, the sit ins, all of that to get progress done. Progress, however, is going to be slow. And that's what's going to lead to a lot of impatience with the younger crowd that is involved in all of this. So groups like CORE, they're going to become impatient eventually. Now, the younger crowd, though, does a lot of the footwork when it comes to the civil rights movement and to that nonviolent protest that is so, so important to this movement. Now, the first sit-in takes place at the Woolworths counter, lunch counter right here in Greensboro, North Carolina. And this takes place February 1st, 1960. So what you're going to see is a bunch of college students and high school age students do these things, these sit-ins at lunch counters. And, you know, they're going to remain at the lunch counter until they're either served or arrested. So they try to purchase items, you know, and this lunch counter was reserved for whites, but they're refusing to get up. They're just minding their own business. So, over the next couple weeks, protesters are going to fill all 68 seats until the store closed due to a telephone bomb threat and the escalation of protests. But what you're going to see all through the South and in North Carolina is going to be scenes like this. You see them sitting at the lunch counter. And yeah, there's a couple white people there. Because they did this in solidarity. You're seeing how they're being treated. Stuff's getting thrown on them. They're probably getting hit. They're probably getting punched. They're probably getting cigarette burns on them. All of these terrible things are happening to these people. And they cannot fight back. Because if you fight back, you basically... Just throw your cause out, out of the water right there. You know, you have to be peaceful. That's all nonviolent protest is. It has to be peaceful. You have to be peaceful and take the violence being handed to you because you want to garner sympathy for your movement. So SNCC is going to be the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. These guys are the ones who are going to organize stuff like the sit-ins and the peaceful marches and whatnot. So SNCC, again, a combination of white and black students, is going to be the ones doing the jail-ins, all of that, in order to try to desegregate various places in society. So they're going to try to basically try their damnedest to get on TV, because if they, feel, they feel if they can get on TV and show what's going on in the South, you know, it's going to get people up north really riled up and want to pressure Congress and stuff to get things changed. So we're going to talk more about SNCC later because them along with CORE are going to form the crux of the black power movement in the late 60s. But basically, sit-ins are going to be the most successful measure out of all of this. They're going to desegregate public parks, swimming pools, theaters, churches, libraries, museums, beaches, all of that. So, that's our little preview for civil rights in the 50s. I'm going to switch over to popular culture right now so that um, we can get to the rest of the 50s 
and you know next time around we'll hit up the 60s so switching gears to popular culture all right when we think about popular culture of the 50s what we think of is pretty much tv right consumerism um so the 50s we kind of think of stuff like greece or happy days or leave it to beaver or whatever where the majority of Americans are going to experience prosperity, stability, confidence in the future, it's going to look like Pleasantville. So, a growing middle class happens around this time. We think about white sub suburbs, you know, like Levittown, um, social norms existing because, well, hello, we're fearing communism and the second red scare here. We don't want to be labeled a communist, so there's a bunch of consensus going around and conformity with social behaviors. So, yeah, we don't want to stand out of the crowd. We want to just be part of the status quo. But we also have, like, you know, consumerism where we're buying all these new things, all these new appliances, we're buying cars, fast food, you name it. TV advertising is going to be really popular at this time. Because, I mean, this is your typical 50s scene right here, right? Everybody looks freaking perfect. That living room spotless. <laughs> and people are wearing suits and stuff to just hang out with the family. <laughs> like, really, no. Come on. But still, though, that's your stereotypical view of the 50s, is it not? But really, what we just covered with the Civil Rights Movement, that's not everybody's 1950s experience. Certainly, this is white suburbia's experience of the 50s, not, you know, the African-American community's experience of the 50s, for sure. So let's go ahead and talk about some TV. All right, TV is very popular. It's our most popular form of entertainment now. And, um, you know, this is about the time where you start to see TV shows come up. TV shows like we did talk about, like Leave it to Beaver. And they're going to show, like, basically white suburbia, right? There are a couple of ethnic shows, but they're going to disappear. And it's, yeah, mostly going to be white suburbia. <laughs> but uh, we kind of refer to this as the golden age of television because of the quality of programs. I mean, it, it, we refer to it as, like, classic TV, right? So advertising revenue is going to grow by leaps and bounds during this time because, yeah, if everybody's glued to the TV watching it, of course, t television advertisements and commercials are going to skyrocket. So we're going to see, like, soap operas. We're going to see game shows, sports, you know, comedy shows, all of this, news is going to be on TV. A lot of people are going to criticize TV for, like, rotting your brain, pretty much. <laughs> Creating mindless entertainment. Dude, where have we heard that before? Uh, but, yeah, it kind of starts off here. So, really, the number of TVs growing in the American household grows by leaps and bounds. Look at that. 1946 is when TV first comes out, and there's very few, but by the time 1960 comes around... Dude, we got TV everywhere. <laughs> so here's some of the TV shows we're talking about, like Howdy Doody, which is more like your kid's show. American Bandstand, which would be kind of geared towards teenagers. Playhouse 90, again, this is kind of like a soap opera. Um, I Love Lucy, it's a comedy show, and Sid Caesar is also comedy. So we got a whole bunch of stuff going on. The Honeymooners, Leave it to Beaver, just like all kinds of stuff. So advertising, like we were saying, is going to boom at this time, just like it did during the Gilded Age when we had our first big round of consumerism. Again, in the 20s when we had our second big round of consumerism, this would kind of be like the third big round of consumerism where people are buying everything. TVs, radios, newspapers, magazines are all bombarded with advertisement and also a new sort of advertisement which sprang up in the 20s, but becomes even more popular in the 50s, billboard advertisement. So, of course, it's like, you know, displaying stuff that people want. Look at Lucky Strikes right there. <laughs> Making smoking look fashionable. Um, <laughs> advertising, just everything. 
And of course the ads are going to play to your appeals. Why not? <laughs> Plus, oh, um, we got actual physical credit cards now. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, it's not as disastrous as the 20s like installment plans like buy now, pay later, stock market crash. <laughs> no, it's actually, it's charge it, go into debt. Oh, that's a bad idea. <laughs> it's more like that. So anyways, fast food restaurants are going to become immensely popular in the 50s. Because now people are driving more. I mean, we got the, what, the Highway Act that Eisenhower had passed. So we got interstate highways going around. We got a lot more of these fast food places with McDonald's leading the show right here. So um, when it comes to culture and society, though, we're going to have a little bit of a religious revival happen around this time. So if you guys know what televangelists are, yeah, this is about the time they come around. <laughs> so, um, up until 1950, less than 50% of Americans belong to a church or a temple. But by the late 50s, 75% are going to claim, you know, a religious organization and their belief in God and whatnot. Because remember, we don't want to seem out of the crowd here. We want conformity and, well, communists don't really get along too well with organized religion so what better way to show that you're not a communist <laughs> organized religion so tv <laughs> is going to be used extensively to promote our religious agenda here so televangelism <laughs> is going to be born <laughs> at this time where you got preachers basically doing sermons across the airwaves and it's going to be huge masses following them. So, this is what's going on. And um, now, a lot of people are contributing this uptick in religion because of the Cold War and communism, like we just talked about right now. And uh, so, yeah, people like Billy Graham are going to become really popular televangelists promoting the word. So this is about the time when we add that whole phrase under God to the Pledge of Allegiance as well. So, yeah, here's some Billy Graham televangelism going on outside. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, look at that crowd. So here's a very, very important thing about women. I want you guys to pay particular attention to this. Women's roles are going to change drastically in the 50s. Because, I mean, during World War II, we're basically like, yeah, badass Rosie the Riveter. We can do it. Let's work in the factories and make some tanks. <laughs> but now in the 50s, women are being told, hey, go bake a cake, take care of the kids, stay at home. Mm-hmm. So, the baby boom and the growth of suburbs are going to make homemaking a full-time job for women. So, you see how the pendulum has swung back a bit towards the, your more traditional stereotypes of women. So, um, people are going to feel that that's the women's place. It's in the home with the family. Now, there's going to be this whole movement going on, and it's kind of started by this book, The Feminine Mystique, written by Betty Friedan, who looks into this phenomena of a bunch of, like, well-educated women who are middle class, who are really dissatisfied with their lives. You've got women who've got, like, PhDs, man, who went to college, went to law school, went to medical school went through the whole freaking thing only to become a housewife and a mother while their husbands practiced law and medicine or were professors and whatnot. And the acceptable thing for women at that time was, well, I was trying to meet my husband. Dude, you had better grades than your husband. <laughs> you should be the doctor or the lawyer or whatever. 
So these women are feeling really dissatisfied with their lives. And, you know, they couldn't understand it. They're like, we got everything we need. We got a family. We got, like, money. We got all this stuff. So it's more of a psychological phenomenon. But now that the problem has been exposed through books like The Feminine Mystique, women are going to start to see the solidarity amongst their ranks and want more, more equality. So women are going to start pushing for their rights in part because they got involved with the African-American community in, like, you know, helping to do carpools for, the, like, the bus boycott and stuff. So they see what the African-American community is doing to push for their rights, and they're going to apply this to the new women's rights movement that's going to spring up in the late 50s and all through the 60s and early 70s. So keep that in mind. We will draw some more comparisons to antebellum reform and how that helped spurn the women's rights movement back then in the 1840s it's kind of similar here in the 1950s and 60s but we will come back to this in the 60s when we cover the women's rights movement more in depth for now conformity for women and gender stereotypes for women in the 50s so as far as like you know the silent apathetic generation that we're talking about here so, of course, stability and conformity are going to be the norms for this generation. And we see TV reinforce this conformity and stability within its TV shows like Father Knows Best, Leave it to Beaver, The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. Family roles are clearly marked. The father was a breadwinner. The mother was a homemaker. The children were perfect kids. So this stereotype is enforced more and more through media and even through the workplace. I mean, women are now regarded as secretaries, the cute secretary in the office. You know, n n little to no upward mobility. So when it comes to youth, though, in the 50s, this is where we start to see challenges to these societal norms. And it's going to be stuff that, well, obviously we don't see with these picture-perfect television families, like Leave it to Beaver, Ozzie and Harriet, Father Knows Best, right? They look perfect. Really, where we're going to start to see the cracks in this conformity through America's youth is through stuff like rock and roll. So, rock music becomes popular in the 50s, of course, with Elvis, right? But... Let's face it, man, rock is a mixture of blues and country and bluegrass and like all that stuff. So really African-Americans have a large hold on rock and roll at this time as well. So rock and roll is going to shock adults, think it's, oh my God, it's too vulgar. And teenagers love it because they're like, dude, this is cool music. <laughs> so... Of course, at this time, we dub Elvis Presley as the king of rock and roll because he brings it to the white masses. Let's just face it. Let's call it what it is. Uh, <laughs> but people enjoy his music. So, yeah, you got to give him credit for that, too. But anyways, Elvis popularizes rock and roll with the white crowd. African-Americans, though, I mean, hey, we got Chuck Berry, Little Richard, among a whole lot more. Buddy Holly um, is another white rock and roller, but still, I mean, you're going to see African Americans super popular with rock and roll. Um, but of course, yeah, Elvis. Now, another thing that contributes to this dismantling of conformity is going to be a fear of juvenile delinquency that's brought about in films like The Wild One, Rebel Without a Cause. So these films kind of promote this whole juvenile violence and delinquency epidemic that people thought was plaguing society. When it comes to books, um, books are going to pretty much attack this conformity head on, like uh, White Collar, Organization Man, and Man in the Gray Flannel Suit. So these books attack, you know, this obsessiveness with wanting to fit in for job and community. 
doing everything, sacrificing your life for your job, you know, all of this just shows the conformist pressures that society was placing on people in the 50s. But we do have this string of counterculture starting to spring up amongst the beats. These guys are basically the precursors to the hippies, all right? They are going to rebel against conformity and the consumerist culture of the 50s. So the beats are basically <laughs> your emo coffeehouse type that we see now. These guys are going to be doing slam poetry. And, um, dude, they look like hipsters. <laughs> Just saying. But anyways, uh, they're going to recite some slam poetry, jazz music, all of that. So we got people like Allen Ginsberg and his poem Howl. That's going to like embody the movement here. Jack Kerouac with his famous novel on the road which also addresses these non-conformist issues as well and really the beats are going to be the forerunner for you know the counterculture movement in the 60s these guys are the precursors like i said they look like hipsters <laughs> so there's Ella Ginsberg and jack kerouac all right so if you guys have never seen slam poetry check it out on youtube it's there <laughs> You might even find, like, an example with the Goofy movie. It's, it's legit. <laughs> it's slam poetry, all right? Just think of, like, somebody, like, wearing their beret, <laughs> black turtleneck, snapping their fingers, reciting poetry while somebody is, like, bla like wailing on the drums and stuff. I mean, <laughs> and playing some jazz in the background. Yeah. That, that's the beat movement. <laughs> So, okay, let's go ahead and round this off with five trends that we saw in the 50s that are going to continue on to the 60s. So, the Vietnam War. Eisenhower's aid to South Vietnam is going to blow into, like, a full-scale <laughs> war involvement that's going to cost us 58,000 American lives and over a million Vietnamese. So, we got that looking to look forward to in the 60s. We've got the Civil Rights Movement, who gets its start it's kickstart with Brown versus Board in uh, the 50s, but we also have um, the ball rolling with these sit ins, these marches, and boycotts, and all of that. So, the civil rights movement is going to continue throughout the 60s. The counterculture, which gets its start with the beat, the beat movement, and how people are criticizing mass conformity and consumerism, is going to continue on as the counterculture and the hippies of the 60s and then the great white society so conservatism in the 50s with its hands-off pro-business approach to government is going to actually bring about the exact opposite it's going to bring about liberal reforms with kennedy and with lbj through the new frontier and the great society and then we've got the beginnings of the space race. We're freaked out by Sputnik. We start to throw a whole bunch of money towards math and science education and the development of NASA. So NASA is going to take us to the moon in 1969. So there we go, guys. We have went through the, the 50s civil rights movement and popular culture in a whirlwind right there. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. This is one of my more popular topics to cover. So, we will cover some more about the 60s next time. We're going to start off with domestic and foreign policy. Then we're going to hit up some civil rights and then popular culture once again. So, I will catch you guys later. Bye, guys.